Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob and I am one of two poultry specialists at the University of Kentucky. The other one is Dr. Tony Pescatori. Um, and we work with small and backyard flocks and we did a, a series of webinars last year on various topics and we were asked to do uh, some topics on breeding for purebred chickens. So this one is the follow-up to that, looking at breeding of purebred chickens. It's a four-part uh, webinar series, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to either type it in the chat box or the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Pescatori will be monitoring those. And if there are questions that are a clarification of what I'm talking about, he will pop in and interrupt me to get the clarification. Otherwise, the questions will um, stay for the end. Um, and I say, if you think of a question that you want answered, you know, just type it in before you forget. Um, I can't see the chat box when I start presenting, so I was going to put in the link to the recording from last week's. Uh, it's in my presentation, and in case you uh, wanted to um, see it. Okay, let me find my presentation. There we go. Can you see it, Tony? I can't hear you, but I think you said okay. <laughs> yes, okay, so, I can see it. Okay, this, as I said, is a webinar series, four part series. Uh, the first webinar was held last, last week. It was an introduction to poultry genetics. And as I said, the uh, link to the YouTube recording of the, the presentation is available there. Uh, some of the things we talked about last week, just as a reminder, is that uh, DNA is the in the nucleus of each cell and the nucleus has chromosomes which transmit genetic material from one generation to the next and they come in pairs. A gene is a segment of DNA that is the basic unit of hereditary, so feather color, comb type, etc. And again, they come in pairs with one from each parent. The DNA and RNA are made up of nucleic acid. So RNA is ribonucleic acid. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. They have those um, nucleic acids listed there. And occasionally an or error will occur in the replication of the DNA. And this will change the nature of the protein that it produces, results in a mutation, and that can change the phenotype or the appearance of the, the animal. Alleles are different versions of a gene on a chromosome that determine a specific heritable characteristic and the locus is the position on the chromosome at which the allele is found. Locus is one, loci is plural. Genes on the same chromosome are linked and are usually inherited together, but linkage is never 100% because crossover events occur when the body manufactures sperms and egg cells. The rate of crossover events is proportional to the distance between the two genes. So the farther away they are, the more likely they are to cross over to another uh, chromosome. Uh, interactions between alleles at one locus can be dominant recessive, co-dominant, incomplete dominant, and you can have interactions between alleles at different loci. So you can get an epistatic event where one gene affects the phenotype, um, uh, the, the expression of another gene. So all of those things come into play when we're talking about hereditary. 
And each gene has a promoter sequence, then the template sequence that determines the protein, and then the termination sequence. An error can occur anywhere along that line. It can occur in the promoter sequence so that it doesn't, uh, the template sequence never happens. Can happen in the template so that you get a, an error in the protein or in the termination sequence where it terminates early or doesn't terminate at all. So all of those types of errors can occur uh, with different genes. So today's webinar is a follow-up to that, and we will look at the genetics of some specific chicken traits. It is impossible for me to cover all the different traits and all the different genes involved. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a few of them, and then next week we will be talking about breeding and selecting breeders and uh, whatnot. But the idea is to show you some of the genes involved in the different traits that we select for with purebred chickens. This is not the quantitative genetics for um, egg production, growth rate, that kind of thing. This is more for the phenotypic appearance of the, uh, the animal or the bird. And you know, many different breeds have been developed over the years and they're related to each other. Um, so there is some gene overlapping, but you do get um, mutations that can occur in one line and another line can have a different mutation that has the same result in the phenotype. So um, different genes can be involved depending on the breed involved. So if we start looking at comb types, there are uh, nine different comb types that are currently recognized. Single comb is the wild type. It's what the red jungle fowl has. Then there's the rose, the pea, the walnut, cushion, strawberry, <coughs> excuse me, V-shaped buttercup, and a more recent ad addition, the carnation. So as I said, the wild type is the single comb. So that's no mutation. The rose comb mutation caused a change in the shape of the comb. It was with the MNR2 gene. It was moved to a new genomic location leading to the misexpression of the gene during the comb development. I apologize, my cat is driving me nuts. Um, and so roosters that are homozygous, they have both the dominant uh, our gene for rose comb have been shown to have poor mortality, and it's because of a disruption of the CD, CCDC108 gene located at one of the areas where that mutation occurred. So there, for some rose combs, uh, there is that linkage to uh, poor sperm motility resulting in poor fertility. But there are two different uh, mutations that resulted in the, um, the rose comb. Uh, they call them R1 and R2. And there are two different kinds of rose combs that you can see where the point goes up or the point goes down. And I'm not sure which one is which, but R1 is linked to the reduced fertility, where R2 is not linked to reduced fertility. So the type of rose comb that you have depends on different gene mutations. So um, you could cross the two different kinds and end up with you know, both genes interacting. Um, I don't know of any research that has looked at that, but um, there may be some out there. The P comb is the uh, mutation with the designation P, and it's a misexpression mis of the SOX5 gene during comb development in, during embryology. It's an autosomal dominant, so uh, with heterozygotes, the 
the dominant P and lowercase b, so they have one of each, having a slightly larger cone than those with that have the two dominant genes. Uh, and for some, there is some linkage possible with the marbling down pattern and the blue egg. Not all those that lay blue eggs have rose combs or marbling down patterns, but there has been some linkage shown for some breeds. Uh, and then there is the combined effects of the uh, P and rose comb mutations. So if it has uh, at least one dominant P and one dominant R, you end up with a walnut comb. So if you take a P comb male and a rose comb female, the rose comb female has, uh, that has, um, that is a pure breeding, per pure breeding rose comb. So she is homozygous for the rose and um, homozygous recessive for the P comb and the P comb that is homozygous recessive for the rose and homozygous dominant for the P comb. Each one can, the P comb can do one small R, one big P, and the rose comb female, the dominant R and the lowercase p, and all of them will come out walnut. But if you cross the walnut with the walnut, so you get the F2 generation, you're gonna get a, a variety of different combinations. And so those that have all the lowercase uh, recessive forms are single comb, the wild type, if they have at least one of the dominant um, P, then they have a P comb, as long as they have the, the two recessive for rows. So 1 16th are single, 3 16th are P, 3 16th are rows because they are lowercase uh, recessive for the, the um, P comb, but they have at least one dominant uh, rose comb, and then nine sixteenths of them are walnut. They have at least one dominant for each of the two traits. So if you breed a walnut comb with a walnut comb, uh, you're gonna, that is not a, um, that is the offspring from the P and rose, then you get the, uh, what they call a 9331 um, ratio of offspring. Okay, you get another mutation that has occurred. It's called the duplex comb. It's a D designation. It is an autosomal incomplete dominance, and they have three different uh, alleles at that uh, loci. So it could be the D plus, which is the wild type, which has um, no doubling at all. You get the DV, which is doubling of the comb plus suppression of tissue mass. So you end up with the V-shaped one, which is also associated with enlarged nostrils. And then you get the buttercup, which is the doubling of the comb only. Um, again, some possible linkages are the polydactyl fifth comb and multi multiple spurs, but again, they don't have to occur. Uh, there are three breeds with buttercup combs. We're all familiar with the Sicilian buttercup because it's something that you see here, but in Europe, they also have the La Camont and uh, in Germany, they have the Osberger. So there are variations of it. So we looked at single rose pea walnut V-shaped buttercup. So um, I tried to figure out the um, cushion and strawberry genetics. And um, cushion comb is seen basically in the Chanticleer, which was developed in Canada from Cornish Leghorn and Why Not breeds uh, over successive um, combinations of breeding. And then the Orlif uh, in Russia also have it. 
And basically, uh, it is a modification of the walnut comb, uh, and they're not sure of all the different genes that may be involved. The Chanticleer is also been bred for uh, winter tolerance. Um, and there are two genes uh, that have been um, found to be involved in that. The ME3 gene is related to fat metabolism and the ZNF36 is related to the nervous system. So a bunch of monks working in Quebec uh, did multiple different crosses and trying different things and selecting for cold hardiness and they came up with the Chanticleer. The uh, strawberry comb in the Malay and Yokohama is also a modification of the walnut comb. The carnation comb is uh, basically a single comb with these two side sprigs and it is specific in the Empordanisia and the Pendenzenkia, I don't know how to say that, uh, breeds that were recently developed. And uh, I could not find a spe which specific mutation or gene is involved in that, but there are multiple genes involved in um, comb size and um, weight and width and all those. So there's more genes than those mutations that uh, I've mentioned. Um, so when you're selecting for comb, you are uh, selecting for multiple um, genes. And then there's the Breda chicken uh, BD mutation, which has no comb at all. You get some chickens that have a crest on their head, um, and it's the CR gene. It's autosomal incompletely dominant, and it's a misexpression of five closely linked genes. Uh, that are the HOXC genes. There are multiple of them, as you can see here, this, the crested Polish and the silky, it's mostly the HOXC10 uh, that causes uh, their um, type of crest. And then the Appenzeller Spitz, Haben, whatever breed, it is actually the HOXC8 gene. So there are five different genes that can be involved in the different types of crests that you can get uh, on chickens' heads. Muffs and beards that you see in the Americana, some of the Polish varieties, uh, is uh, from the HOX B8. So this was the HOXC. This is the HOXB gene. Uh, it's a single locus, incompletely dominant. So it gets um, different variations. So um, it's another one of those things that um, it comes in different shapes and sizes, probably has other genes involved in it as well. Ear tufts. Uh, from the um, Ar Aracana chicken is the ET. It's the feather covered facial epidermal appendage that projects from the side of the chicken's head. Uh, the Aracana chicken is the main one that has it. It is autosomal incompletely dominant and research has shown that it is a lethal condition. So Embryos can die at 17 to 19 days of incubation with 100% mortality if it's homozygous for the ear tuft uh, gene and 20% mortality in the heterozygotes. So if you are breeding uh, Aracanas, um, that they can only be one dominant, one recessive so that uh, each parent is donating one of each. One quarter will have both of the dominant ear tuft genes and will die. One quarter will not have any ear tufts and one half will be heterozygous and have ear tufts with about 20% mortality in the, the hatch. So that's what the research says. Uh, if you have different experience with it, I'd be interested in 
uh, hearing how that went. Earlobe color, there are lots of different genes involved in it. Red and white earlobes dominate. The white is due to purine based deposition into the earlobes. Uh, red is due to a mixture of different pigments, including melanin and carotenoids. Variation in earlobe color can be due to ancestral linkages and a variety of different mutations. And variation in earlobe color can also be due to adaptability to local conditions, temperature, uh, health of the birds can affect, um, so the environment can help, can affect the phenotyp, phenotypic expression of the genotype. And there are some that have blue, purple, black earlobes, uh, depending on the breed. And uh, from what I could find in the research, um, there are a lot of papers on it. It is very, very multifactorial. There are a lot of different genes involved. In one study, at least 18 genes were found. In other studies, a different set of genes were found. Some are believed to be sex linked in some breeds. Uh, so earlobe color is uh, definitely polygenic with many different uh, genes affecting the color intensity um, of the, the earlobes. Toes, most chickens have four toes, three in the front and one in the back. There is a condition known as preaxial polydactyly, which is five toes. Um, so there, it has a right, uh, arisen differently depending on the breed. Uh, so for the Beijing fatty and the silky, it is an autosomal dominant with the PO uh, dominant and the recessive having additional uh, preaxial digit on one or both feet. And it can also occur on the wings. And it's a defect in the regulation of the sonic, sonic hedgehog gene. And I cannot for the life of me figure out where they came up from that with that name, but basically the digital number and identity is controlled by the expression of that gene, which produces a protein that mediates the polarizing activity in the embryo. So in this study, they looked at uh, some x-rays of variation for the silk, silky foot dactyly, so WT stands for wild type. So the wild type has the four digits, three in the front, uh, one in the back. Um, and then they get some with four digits where two comes, where one of them comes off of the second digit and so is in the front. Um, and then um, you get it where you have the five digits where they're coming off of uh, number one. And then you get some where they're coming off of um, a different location and you get six digits. So um, depending on uh, how the, the genes are functioning within the embryo, you're gonna get different numbers uh, of toes. Uh, in the dorking, it came out of a different uh, effect. Um, it's an ectopic expression of several genes in the developing embryo, including the sonic hedgehog and the fibroblast growth factor four. And it gets a slightly different um, way of, of getting that uh, extra digit. Uh, the Houdan has another way of doing it as well. So all three of them ended up with um, with five toes or more, uh, but the genetics involved and what mutation for that extra toe seems to be a little different. So the Beijing and the Silky are similar, um, but the, the um, Houdan is, is uh, definitely different. Uh, and then feathers on the shank, uh, up to three separate loci are believed to be involved. 
two are dominant allele. There are two dominant alleles at there are dominant alleles at two loci and a recessive allele at a third. So all three of them are interacting to determine where um, on the, the shank and toes the feathers are, how much of the feather is there, that sort of thing. Skin color, skin pigment is related to the carotenoid, uh, which are the yellow pigments, and the melanin, which is the black um, pigments. And the typical skin colors that you see are white, yellow, and black. Uh, yellow is determined at the W locus. W allele inhibits the epidermal xanthophyll pigment and is completely dominant to the lowercase w. So uh, they believe it originated from the gray jungle fowl instead of the red jungle fowl and the gene is expressed in the liver, not in the skin. Um, and so uh, yellow, um, which you see there, uh, is the recessive form of it and the dominant allele became, becomes white. Uh, for uh, meat chickens, yellow is um, most popular in North America. Uh, and that yellow pigment that is in the skin comes from um, the yellow corn in the feed. So the amount of pigment in the skin is also affected by the environment because if you don't feed yellow corn in the, pig, in the feed, you're not going to get as much yellow in the skin. We take advantage of the yellow skin in the leghorn by um, the depigmentation, um, it's probably not the right word, um, skin cells are constantly turned over and when a hen starts laying, she takes the uh, pigment from the feed and puts it in the yolk instead of the skin and so she starts to lose pigment um, in the skin and we can tell which hens have laid the most eggs based on the amount of pigment that has bleached out of the, uh, the yellow skin. The white skin, as I said, is determined at the W locus, um, and the W allele inhibits the epidermal xanthophyll pigmentation and is completely dominant to the lowercase, which would result in yellow. Why they pick W for something that makes it yellow, I don't know, but hey, what the heck. Uh, so white skin, as I said, is determined at the W locus. And so um, the white skinned chicken is um, actually more popular in Europe, um, especially Britain. They like that they don't like the yellow skinned chicken. They prefer the white skinned chicken. And they also, instead of feeling, feeding yellow corn, tend to fe feed more barley and wheat, which are lower. Uh, in the xanthophylls, and so they're not getting any from the environment of the feed and genetically as well. So they get that whiter skin that they prefer. And with the white skinned birds, we cannot use the, the uh, pigment loss to evaluate um, past egg production, fortunately. The black skin hyper uh, pigmentation, FM, it started with the, the Muchan breed, um, does not appear to be a Mendelian trait. Some lines still produce lighter colored or white skinned birds. Uh, it affects the agouti signaling protein gene, ACIP for short, that plays an important role in melanin synthesis. And they have a T allele, which is associated with the black skin and the C allele, which is associated with the, with the white skin, and they interact with the NC1R gene. So you can get various levels of um, pigmentation. Uh, aside from the black skin, they usually also have black meat, black bones, black organs. Um, they're very popular in Asia. Um, the black skin for the breeds of the silky 
Ayami Semi Black Hmong and the Swathana or whatever um, is also FM. It increases the EDM3 activity and is associated with promoting the melanoblastic proliferation. And you can see when you open up the bird that the, the bones, the meat, everything is black. Uh, Sex-linked mutation ID also appears to be involved. ID is an inhibitor of dermal melanin. So if you have the uh, dominant FM with the uh, Z chromosome having this mutation, um, you can have it one of them with the female or two with the uh, male, then you get darkly pigmented black skin. If you have um, the uh, inhibitor gene, then you get faintly pigmented. And if you get the wild type, then they're unpigmented. So you can see that just because it has black when you're crossing it, you need to know the genotypes involved before you can even figure out what um, the, uh, the um, output of the offspring might look like. So um, that is why pedigree records are extremely important in breeding for purebreds. And we will be discussing that next week when we're talking about breeding programs. Shank color varies from black to blue, green, yellow, or white. It is also determined by that ID gene, which is a uh, inhibitor of dermal melanin. It also has the extended black, which I'll be discussing shortly, and yellow legs, the W, and other regulatory genes, including the sex-linked barring gene, the dominant white, and the recessive allele to the sex-linked yellow skin loci. I'll get into those in a minute, but it is obviously an interaction of all those different genes which are going to tell you the shank color. So if you're trying to breed to the standard of perfection in terms of shank color, you need to know your pedigree of the birds involved. I did find a green, uh, chick, a green shanked breed, which was a Polish breed um, for which green shanks were normal. It did, uh, the research did not discover how, what genes were involved in that. So I don't know exactly how that was developed, um, but the green is supposed to be there. But for some, breeds, having green in the shanks is considered a defect. And as I said, it's Z-linked recessive, and it's a due to the interaction again between the ID locus, which is the inhibitor of uh, dermal melanin, and the locus for yellow skin. So lots of interactions going on between genes. And then green spots on the Ancona is another allele that you can get um, on the Anacona, for example. Um, so you get, you know, different combinations can result in black with white soles, white with shanks and feet, black shanks, white soles, blue shanks, white soles, all those different things. So you need to know the the genes involved for your pedigree. There was a uh, one that uh, mutation that made the news a while back, and that is the scaleless um, chicken. Um, it is a um, recessive gene, SC. It causes a lack of almost all body feathers, as well as foot scales and spurs, due to a failure of skin patterning during patterning during embryogenesis. It's considered a defect, although um, there has been talk of, you know, using it where, you know, it's really hot, so they don't, you know, feathers aren't causing a problem, and you don't have to pluck the chickens because it doesn't have any feathers. Um, but all the ones that I've seen look really, really red, and I don't know that I would want to eat it, so um, 
but it was first seen in the New Hampshire breed, but it did make the news a while back. The naked neck has no feathers on the neck. It was originally from the Transylvania naked neck breed, autosomal dominant, uh, and it is the GFD7 gene which suppresses feather development. Um, so while the naked neck is uh, a, a breed, it is also a trait that is being seen as a variety because you can introduce the naked neck gene into other breeds. Um, and so you can see naked neck for um, different breeds and varieties. Uh, the, the Transylvania naked neck used to be called the turkin because some people thought it was a cross between a chicken, chicken and a turkey, but it's not. It's a mutation on uh, that particular gene. Vulture hawks, which for most breeds is considered a defect. Feathers in the cruel feather tract of the tibia are increased in length and rigidity, taking on the appearance of a flight feather. It is an autosomal recessive gene. Um, so th this one here shows you the, the feather tract that, that is involved um, that causes the vulture hawk. So you could have a, gene, I mean, a, a strain of your birds that has that recessive gene there and you don't know it because it's recessive, but if you're doing a lot of Inbreeding, it may come out. That is one of the risks of inbreeding is that some of these uh, recessive genes may uh, make an appearance. There is also a double uropedial gland defect. Um, it's an autosomal recessive again, um, DGB. So they get the, the two little knobs on the end there, giving them uh, two preen glands. Um, slow, the speed of feathering has been used commercially uh, for feather sexing. It's a li link to the Z gene, so it is a sex link trait. So if it has the at least one of the dominant uh, case, it's slow feathering, and then lowercase recessive is the fast feathering. So if you take a slow feathering female, which only has one version, which is the uppercase dominant uh, K, and then the W doesn't have anything, and you mate it with a fast feathering male, which has the two recessives, then all the males are going to feather out slow feathering like their mother, and all the females will um, will hatch out and be fast feathering like their father. So at day of hatch, you can uh, feather sex the uh, chicks to, to separate the males and females. This was used when broilers, for example, were raised separately. Uh, nowadays, they're not raised separately, but if you were gonna buy just pullet cockerels, which some like because they think it has a better flavor, um, they can feather sex if they've used that cross. The long tail that you see in some of the exotic breeds is a, proposed to be a dominant allele that they've named GT at one locus and a recessive allele MT on a second locus. The GT is for non-limit on the growth. So the feathers just keep growing and growing and growing. And MT is for no molt. So not only do they keep growing, they don't lose them and have to start all over again. So um, some of the genetics involved in some of the very long tails um, of some, especially the Japanese breeds have a lot of uh, long tails. And then there's the no tail, the rumpless, um, like in the Aracana, and it has its own name, Aracana with the RP. Um, and it does not have a tail. It lacks uh, the vertebrae and everything involved in it. Um, and they've been able to find some of the genetics involved in that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's easy enough to do. 
Hen feathering uh, is when the males have the plumage of females, and an example is the Seabright bantam shown here. The male on the left has feather coloring and the same hackle um, cushion and uh, tail feathers as the female. They can tell them apart by the comb and wattles, um, but the plumage is, is pretty much identical. And this is a genetic condition that's been seen in both Seabright and Camping Bantam breeds. It's related to a simple autosomic gene called HF. Um, both uh, HF with the having homozygous and heterozygous are of the head feathering type. Lower case has normal feathering. Females carry the H feather gene, of course, but you can't identify them because they're females, they're going to have female feathering. Uh, feather pattern, pattern uh, is, whoops, can't see it here, mediated by estrogen. Um, the skin of adult chickens carry um, HF and they end up with increased levels of estrogen. Adults with the HF gene have increased aromatase activity, which converts testosterone to estrogen. And the level in HF uh, dominant um, heterozygous roosters is half the level of the aromatase in the homozygous dominant, but is sufficient to cause head feathering in both the heterozygous and the homozygous. The frizzle feather is uh, curled ratchets and barbs. It's a 15 base pair deletion in the F gene on chromosome 33, incomplete dominance. So homozygous for the dominant gene is more curled than those that are heterozygous. Uh, there is also another gene that can cause silky and that is the hookless or which is also uh, autosomal recessive. So these two conditions developed separately. Plumage color, two pigments are produced by the melanocytes. The eumelanin, which is a black brown color and the pheomelanin, which is yellow and orange. The synthesis of both pigments depends on the um, enzyme tyranase, and so it's involved in the conversion of tyrosine to uh, the um, dark pigment. So at the cellular level, it's regulated by the migration of the melanocytes, the differentiation, cell death, and interaction with neighboring skin cells, and non-melanin chemical pigments and structural colors also affect uh, the appearance of the color. So different plumage patterns begin with a background color, which is the E locus. Other color and pattern genes essentially modify this background. So uh, dominant white eye uh, restricts black pigment. So if you are homozygous for it, you, they're white. If you have the um, non-mutated one, it's black, and then if you have one of each, it's black flecked. Um, and then there are different alleles for it. There's the uh, white, the dun, and the smoky um, versions of the uh, dominant white allele. So you can get different combinations going on. Uh, the C locus um, also affects uh, the pigment, but it is also related to eye color. Um, so normal or wild type with, is um, the most dominant, has full pigmentation and gray eye color. Then the C with RE has red eye and they're white and the recessive white um, is uh, like seen in Plymouth Rocks, Wine Docks, Orpingtons, Jersey Giants, Dorkings, Langshans, and Silky Breeds. Uh, and then the autosomal albino, which is a non-pigment albino phenotype. Those are all mutations on the C locus. Silver a locus on the Z chromosome. So it's another one of those sex-linked traits. Multiple alleles possible. There's the 
the normal wild type, also called gold, and then there's the silver, and then there's the sex-linked imperfect alb albinism, so it'd be albinos. The E. locus has the extended black, the birchen, the dominant wheaton, the wild type, the brown, the buttercup, the recessive wheaton, also known as the yellowish white, and the speckled. So there are different possibilities of alleles at the E. locus. Extended bla uh, black uh, extends the black pigmentation in normally brown or red areas, thus affecting multiple within feather patterns. Uh, it affects the NC1R gene. Uh, there are variations of it um, with the Wheaton like as well. Several within feather patterns are caused by combination effects. The single lacing, the double lacing, the spangling are all uh, different effects with different um, chromosome, different genes being involved. The melatonic is uh, from the black Cornish. It affects within feather pigment patterns, uh, enhancing the contrast between dark and light colored regions, autosomal, incompletely dominant. Uh, and it's a misexpression of the GJA5 gene. Chocolate, again, is a Z uh, sex linked recessive mutation, it dilutes the, the pigmentation, affects the TYRP1 gene. Dark brown is an autosomal recessive, the lesion upstream of the gene. So the gene needs to be activated to function and the deletion happens before the gene. So it affects the um, expression of the XO10 gene. Uh, and then there's the lavender, also known as self blue. It is a feather color dilution. The black pigment is diluted to slaty blue or light gray. Red pigment is diluted to beige or buff. It is an autosomal recessive gene. Blue is a separate uh, mutation. It restricts black pigment. If you have the wild type, which means that it's not there, you have the black. If you have one of them, you get the blue. And if you have um, both of them, then you get the blue splashed phenotype. The pattern gene uh, causes penciling and lacing and combines with some of the other genes to get all the different combinations of feather plumage that we see. Mottling uh, pigmented feathers with wing tips, giving a mottled like appearance, involves mutation of uh, that particular gene there. And there is uh, one, the MOW, which is white plumage with black eyes, and it's not associated with the tyrosinase gene. It is an autosomal recessive uh, and it confirms white plumage with black eyes in one of the Japanese breeds. Barring, there are two different types. These are horizontal striping pattern on individual feathers. There's the autosomal barring, which is adding a black bar on a gold or silver background, and the sex-linked barring, which is adding a white bar on a pigmented background. So the sex-linked B, you get a fully white bar on a red or black um, background. You're getting a dilution of the dermal pigment in the shanks and the beak and a white spot on the head present at hatch. Three possible alleles residing in barring, barring with dilution and barring with extreme dilution. So there are three possible alleles involved. We have used the barring gene because it is on the Z chromosome. If you do a barred female, which is shown on the left here with a non-barred male, all the males will um, feather out barred like their mother and all the females will be non-barred like their father. So we use that a lot um, with the black sex link crosses for egg production. There is also an onosomal dominant in the um, these three breeds here, effect of three different loci, the DBE and PJ all come in together to give that kind of barring uh, on those breeds. 
So you get a lot of different um, within feather patterns, stippled penciling, double lacing, autosomal borrowing, spangling, silver lacing, all of those are uh, interactions between different um, gene types or different, uh, yeah, different genes interacting or not um, on the, the feathers. There is an incomplete dominance also. Um, so there are two alleles, one black, one white. And if you get both of them, then you get blue. Um, that's a, showing the incomplete dominance. This is a different kind of blue. It's not the blue, uh, self blue, which was the lavender. And it's not the BL, which is the, um, it, it, the dilution of the black pigment. Colombian is a considerable variation in the color intensity of the buff red feather pad pigments. Uh, restricts back pigment present in some areas. And you can see that there can be a lot of different genotypes that result in the same phenotype of the Colombian plumage pattern. Same with the Wheaton pattern and the black breasted, which is basically the wild type. That's what the um, jungle fowl has. And then you get the black and the brown. So again, having pedigrees is important because you have to be able to turn determine the genotype involved when you're trying to figure out the result of any particular crossing. The frizzle gene is a misexpression of the KRT68 gene, autosomal incompletely dominant. Uh, and then um, for the Chinese breeds, it's uh, the KRT75 and the KRT75L gene. Um, that's involved. So these were two separate um, evolutions of the frizzle uh, gene. Eggshell color, white elk shells is the white wild type. That's what the um, jungle fowl lays. It involves the port protoporphyrins, uh, which produces red, brown, and black colorations, the bilverdines. Uh, and it's zinc chelate produced the blue and blue green colorations. So jungle fowl, as I said, have the white shelled egg, brown eggs, it's mainly the protoporphyrin nine and they're added late in shell formation. So if you see with the brown here, it is white on the inside, uh, green eggs, um, both oocyanate and protoporphyrin over it. So blue on the inside, and uh, throughout, sorry, this ocean is a blue, and then the green has both. And so it's green on the outside because the brown was added over the blue, but it's actually blue on the inside. So that's interesting. Uh, brown is believed to be controlled by several genes that encode for a variety of proteins and enzymes. And all the genes responsible for brown eggshells have not yet been identified, but that uh, accounts for the various shades of brown that you can see even within uh, the same breed of chickens. The Uusin gene comes in the these uh, particular breeds, different origins depending on the breed. The Aracana, which was created from the Chilean Mapuche fowl, uh, was a retroviral insertion in the SLCO1B3 gene, whereas the Chinese breeds that also lay uh, blue-shelled eggs developed separately, and it's a misexpression of the HMOX1 gene. There is also the problem of fishy taint in egg flavor and is related to the feeding of rapeseed. It's an autosomal recessive that when they were developing some of the brown egg laying lines ended up um, with the inbreeding becoming um, expressed. And so some of the commercial breeds show a fishy taint if you feed uh, the chickens rapeseed. Um, canola meal tends to not have as much of an effect on it, but uh, for these particular breeds, it's usually best to avoid feeding rapeseed. 
Eye color is uh, modified by several genes, some of which we already talked about. And they are associated with both shank and plumage color. So the sex-linked dermal melanin gene uh, enhances dermal shank and eye input eye pigmentation, and then the inhibitor of shank dermal melanin inhibits eye pigmentation, and you get interactions that can result in dark brown eyes. So if you are interested in any particular trait, this uh, website here has gene mutations for a variety of different livestock and pets. Uh, and it's separated into those genes that have non-Mendelian traits or disorders and Mendelian disorders for poultry. There are 99 non-Mendelian traits that they uh, discuss and 134 Mendelian traits. Um, and they, um, some of them, you know, are things that we wouldn't necessarily use for uh, production, but they have been used. The same mutations have a, occurred in humans and, or other animals, and so they've used the chickens as models to study some of those things, whether it's cholesterol, blindness, or some other uh, problems going on. So next week we will be um, discussing breeding programs and um, selecting uh, breeders and developing a breeding program for uh, your backyard flock. So any questions? Somebody asked what, what is a backyard flock or what do you consider a backyard flock? Backyard flock can vary anywhere from, you know, three chickens to 300 to 3,000. There is no clear cut definition of small or backyard. So, I didn't turn any micro, all microphones are turned off. Yes, you should be able to hear, but no microphones are, are on. Um, and I was going to put in, oops. This was the website that has the research. It, it um, cites the research. Um, can you post it? That is the YouTube link from last week. Uh, and uh, this, will, this is being recorded and will be uh, posted up shortly. Uh, are there any good books that have chicken genes? Um, there are a few old ones that have been reprinted. Um, the problem is that um, now they're into genomics and stuff for commercial, so there's not a lot of money in research for um, purebred type genes. Um, but um, there is one called, uh, what was it called? Chicken Genetics or something? I can't remember the name of it. Um, do many of these genes translate to other poultry? Yes, they do. All pigeons, especially, but quail. Um, some ducks. I haven't seen any with geese, but that website that uh, I gave you there um, does um, tell you it, some of them even occur in, for example, budgies. And so um, there are um, some genes that are in humans. They give you the human equivalent. Um, they give you the molecular, you know, what is it, ca what's causing the problem. So they are described as having butterfly combs. Are these synonymous with buttercups? Yes, they're very similar to the buttercups. They're not like the buttercup breed. They're more like butterflies, but um, I think I had one of the examples there for one of the breeds. It's just a version of it. Oh yeah. 
I don't see the YouTube link. I just put it there. You have a question on. Uh, oh, I put it to host and panelists. I didn't do it to everybody. I am sorry. Here, let me do that again. That one's to everyone. And the link for the um, the website, I had the wrong thing selected. There you go. Sorry, those are the two links that I had put up. Genetics of the Fowl, that's one of them. Yeah, I think is the book. Yeah. That's the old classic. Yeah, it's an old classic that they tried to update, but um, it still has a few things that are wrong and there are new things that are being discovered every day. So, um, so if you have a slow feathered breed to a fast feathered and then breed the offspring back, no, it does not work that way. It has to be the slow feathered um, female to the fast feathered male. You can't, the offspring now have uh, heterozygous, it has to be the homozygous, so it won't work. Any of the sex link crosses, you can't do that. You can't um, try to use the offspring to have the, the auto sexing thing. Okay, any other questions? Oh, I have one more question. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? We're at eight o'clock, so our time is is pretty much up. Again, next week we will be talking about um, breeding programs and selecting breeders. And then we'll finish up with the following week on uh, incubation and hatchery management for um, you know, running a hatchery in the state of Kentucky. So looking at Kentucky regulations um, that are some are the same for other states, but um, some of the things to consider. So, okay, thank you guys for joining. As I, I'm going to turn the recording off now. Stop recording.